beginning, the, the defendant herself and her co-conspirators talked about having burdens and barriers or obstacles in context of their own words. What did the phrase unencumbered and fully free mean? To be free from those barriers or obstacles. And looking at the text communications um, on slide 55, um, is this a reference um, to their future together? Correct. Okay. Now, um, if you could take a look at slide 57. Can you tell us why you included the contents of slide 57 um, in your summary? To illustrate the relationship between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Can you, and, and this text communication happened right at the end or around the time of the text communications about JJ being at zero? Yes. Okay. Can you read into the record slide 57, please? Line 61, it's a photograph sent from Lori Vallow to Tad, Chad Daybell with the caption, surprises are waiting. And then there's an image on that screen as well? Correct. Okay. Now, um, let's turn to the text communication um, reflected on slide 58. Why did you include these communications in your summary? I included these communications because it demonstrates an understanding uh, on behalf of Lori Vallow uh, that of a reality of, of whether Chad Daybell is physically present with her or not physically present with her. Okay. Could you read into the record the, uh, uh, the text communications on slide 58? Line 965 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Very good description of what would of what just happened. Wish you were really here to experience this with me. Line 954 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Thank you for being mine. Wish I could wake up and kiss your sweet, tender lips for real. You are my everything. Okay. And so when you see the phrase for real or really here, what significance did that have in terms of their overall communications um, and exchanges? There were a lot of communications between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow in reference to portaling to different spheres of existence or different places so that they could be together spiritually. Uh, these two texts in my indicate an understanding of reality versus fantasy. Turning to the text communications reflected in slide 59. Why did you include these text communications? These text communications reference a family trip that Chad Daybell was taking with his wife and children and relatives and that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell were both upset by the fact that he had to spend time with his family. Can you read these into the record, please? Yes. Line 860 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I will join you. Partly why I am so sad is my Boise trip has turned into a trip with extended family. Not happy about it. Line 859 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. How much more of this can you take? Line 858 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. They want to go to Craters of the Moon National Park. I can't take much more. So trapped. Line 857 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Are we supposed to wait forever? And if you could read sl slide 60. Line 856 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. No, but the next two days will be torture. Thankfully, I will be alone most of Wednesday and beyond. Line 854 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Is that what he wants? For me to sit around waiting for you endlessly and you miserably wasting time is just doesn't feel right. Line 853 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. 
I agree, it feels so drawn out. Line 850 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. It's three broken heart emojis. And let's proceed with line six, uh, slide 61, those. Line 844 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I'm just so frustrated. I'm sorry, honey. Line 843 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. You can't just keep tearing my heart out. I really can't take it anymore. I'm sorry. Line 842 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. It is tearing both of our hearts out. Please look beyond the next two days. Line 841 from Lori Vallow. I apologize. To Chad Daybell. What about the past two days? I didn't even get to talk to you on your birthday. I'm clearly not a priority. I just don't want to be so sad all the time and do heartbroken. And six, um, 62. Line 840 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. If you really loved me, you wouldn't want that either. Line 839 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I could have talked, but the girls were there. I truly love you with all my heart. Line 836 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. You should give all of your love, oh, I'm sorry, you should give all of you love and your attention to your wife and family. I'm just a distraction. Go have fun with your family. I really do want you to. I just can't be in the way anymore. If things change, then we can talk. But we have nothing until things change anyway. Do you want to pause here or finish the text exchange? I believe there's just one or two more slides. It's, um, could you read slide 63, please? Line 833 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Oh, honey, that is so crushing. I feel so destroyed inside. You know my love for you is deep and real. I want change. I'm constantly begging for change. I want you. Nothing else matters. But I am hindering your life, and you deserve better. I love you so intensely. Line 832 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. But I will leave you alone as excruciating as that will be until I hear from you. Line 831 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. You can't say to me nothing else matters because everything is before me. If that's what the Lord wants, then I'm, I just need to do something X so I can pull myself out of this deep despair. It's not like me to be this way. It's been way too much for way too long. Line 830 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. The pain is unbearable. One more. And if you could read guide 64. Line 829 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. You are right. Put me aside until things change. Yes, the pain is unbearable. Line 828 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Are you going to threaten me that I'm unprotected for doing so? Line 827 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Absolutely not. I'm so upset at the circumstances that I am demanding they protect you more than ever. Line 831 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. You can't say to me nothing else matters because everything... I'm sorry, that's a repeat. Okay. That's, that's an error. I apologize. No, that's all right. And then... Um, I think there's one final slide. Okay. The slide, if you could read slide 65. Line 825 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. I'm so alone without you, it is devastating. Line 824 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I feel so alone too. We are surrounded by celestial relatives that are simply obstacles. I'm so sick of it. Line 823 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Me too. What is it that you really want? Line 824 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I want to be with you. That is my greatest hope and dream. I would happily join you tomorrow if it felt like heaven would not strike us down. 
That was a fairly lengthy set of text communications. Why did you include this conversation in the summary? I included it to demonstrate the dynamic of the relationship between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow and the designation of their family, their relatives, as telestial obstacles. Okay. And telestial obstacles to what? To them being together. Okay. Um, and then you said the dynamic of that relationship. Can you help us understand what the, you meant by that? Charles Vallow was no, 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 no objective foundation. Sustained. <clears throat> okay. In your previous answer, you used the words that I did it to demonstrate the dynamic of their relationship. In your review of the hundreds of thousands of data points of this account, did you see exchanges between Lori Vallow and her co-conspirators? Yes. Okay. And in those communications and um, pictures and images, did um, an appearance of a, a relationship or dynamics of her relationship with Chad Daybell become apparent? Yes. Okay. So when you said you included this text exchange conversation as an example of the dynamic of their relationship, can you explain to us what you meant by that? I, what I meant by that is that their relationship is the driving force behind the crimes that are alleged in this case. Okay. And that the telestial relatives, the earthly relatives, are the obstacles. Correct. Now, um, let's turn to additional communication on September, or uh, communication on September 3rd. Um, remind us again, what date was it that um, Tylee Ryan was last seen alive? The last sighting of Tylee Ryan alive took place on September 8th okay. of 2019. Turning to communication from September 3rd of 2019, could you read slide 66 into the record, please? Line 269 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Wi-Fi is in. What you doing? Line 267 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. Working on Z's. What did you decide on username and password? Line 264 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Network name is anti layman Pass, or PW is too many kids. Okay. And, line, that, and that's a number two, not number the word. Number two. Yeah. Uh, line 263 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox, funny. Okay. Let's finish and, and review that, that next slide. Could you read slide 67 into the record, please? Line 262 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow, and I can change it to whatever you want if you want to change it. I am proud of you. No more Z's. Line 261 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. We are trying to get to the bottom of what we need to do to eliminate them completely. I'm sure you will be told also. Line 260 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Excellent. Um. If you don't mind pausing right here and, and looking at this conversation, it, um, could you explain to us why you included this part of the conversation between Alex Cox and Lori Vallow in your summary? Yes. Alex Cox and Lori Vallow both moved to Rexburg, Idaho uh, around September 1st and 2nd of 2019. I included this text uh, mainly for line 264, uh, which is the password Alex Cox designated for their network of too many kids. Okay. Um, and that's a text Alex Cox to Lori Vallow, correct? Yes. Did Alex Cox have any children living with him in Rexburg, Idaho? No. Um, of the two siblings, who had the children living in Rexburg, Idaho? Lori Vallow. Okay. Um, I also see network name is anti layman in context of your review of all these records. Um, did that, uh, the records you reviewed and the investigation, 
Um, and your knowledge of this investigation yield to understand what anti, anti layman was a reference to? Yes. What is that? Layman is another uh, individual uh, referenced in the Book of Mormon. He is a brother of Nephi, so it's simply just a word chosen for their password. Okay. And Network it, name, excuse me. That's okay. And um, is lay, layman known as a good guy or a bad guy? A bad guy. Okay. I also see the, the letter Z, um, and I, I understand that's been used throughout the iCloud. What is that a reference to? Zombies. Okay. Um, and I also see line 261. There's a conversation where Lori is talking to Alex. What, if any, significance did line 261 have to you? The significance of that is the uh, partnership with Chad Daybell uh, that Lori Vallow had in this alleged work in which they were engaged in eliminating zombies. Okay. And yet it's a text communication to Alex Cox, so why would that be relevant if it wasn't with, with Chad? There are a number of communications between Alex Cox and Lori Vallow that relate to the religious concepts that are discussed throughout the iCloud. Okay. And um, the text, it says we are are trying to get to the bottom of what we need to do to eliminate them completely. I'm sure you will be told also. And it was Alex who responded to Lori saying, excellent? Yes. Okay. Moving um, to additional conversation on September 3rd, 2019. Can you read for us um, the contents of slide 68? Line 259 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. I am going to get lunch and probably go to the range to sight in my rifles. Line 258 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. Fun. You need the practice. Line 257 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. I do. Line 253 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. Bad news on our brother. Line 252 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. What's that? Line 251 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. Z. Line 250 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Really? When was that? And let's, uh, may I ask you to read slide 69, please? Line 232 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. Forced out, I think. Line 231 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. With his anxiety, he wasn't strong enough to fight back. Line 230 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Mm. Line 229 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. JJ is stronger, fights then off every day. Line 228 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. Zach was a 3L. JJ is a 4 comma 3 L in slide 70 line 227 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow that's when he yells no line 222 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow okay line 221 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow my lips are sealed line 220 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox Good boy. Learning more. I'll fill you in this afternoon. Why did you include these last several slides in your summary um, of your observations of the iCloud? I included them to demonstrate that Alex Cox was a participant and uh, in this group in discussing these religious concepts, including designating people as zombies and that he was, he understood those things in these communications. Um, and who is it who conveys this information to Alex Cox in this text exchange? 
his sister, Lori Vallow. Okay. Is that an indicative pattern you found in the iCloud that Lori Vallow would convey information to her brother, Alex Cox? Yes. Did you see any additional evidence that Lori would s sort of supply Alex affirmation like we see on line 220, good boy? Yes. Okay. Was that a pattern you saw in the iCloud? It was. We saw those kinds of, or I saw those kinds of communications <laughs> on a number of occasions. Okay. And in any of those communications between Lori and Alex, did you ever see Lori suggesting to Alex that people weren't zombies? Can you rephrase that? Sure. In the text communications between Alex Cox and Lori Vallow, did you ever see communications where the concept of certain dark entities or zombies came up where Lori was sort of pulling Alex back or telling him, no, they're not zombies? No. Okay. Okay. Now let's turn to slide 71. What are we seeing here? This is uh, from the videos section of Lori for Style. There was a, a number of very short uh, videos that existed. This is just one of those that documents a trip that Lori Vallow, Alex Cox, Tylee Ryan, and J.J. Vallow took to Yellowstone National Park on September 8th of 2019. And this is the last known video of Tylee Ryan alive. Why did you include this? Because it was the last one, Tylee, where Tylee was alive? Yes. And the image on the screen is her, JJ, and Alex Cox. Correct. Um, Your Honor, I, I can certainly, I, at what point does the court want to take a, a lunch break? Just any time between now and noon is fine. Um, this might be a good place to stop, Judge. Okay, we can do that. Okay. <coughs> All right, we'll take our lunch recess. Uh, let's go ahead and have the jurors excused for lunch, and then I'll address counsel briefly um, after they're excused. All right, please. Please be seated. Um, Your Honor, you indicated you wanted a counsel present. Do you want the witness in here or out of here? It's fine with the witness in here. I just okay. want the jurors excused. Counsel, I'm going to make a ruling on the proposed upcoming exhibits that have been proffered by the state. I'm going to do that at the end of the lunch break before the jurors are brought back in. So if we could reconvene at about 1245, I think I'll be ready to make a ruling on the bench from that point. Okay. And we'll do that without the jurors present. Okay. Thank okay. you, Judge. Thank you. We'll be in lunch recess. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. On the record on KCR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Counsel is here present. The jurors are not present. The defendant is also here present in the courtroom. 
Uh, the court wanted to take up an issue on an evidentiary ruling before the jurors came back in after the lunch break. Uh, at issue are three proposed exhibits that have been uh, offered. They haven't yet technically been offered, but in um, essentially a motion in limine here that's been argued, they've been uh, given courtesy copies to the court and counsel for a preliminary ruling as to the admissibility or inadmissibility of the exhibits. Where they're not identified by proposed numbers at this point, I'll just refer to the three uh, exhibits as follows. I'll be, be referring to the first one as what we'll call the Nick Edwards PowerPoint. The second one is the James and Elena Story PowerPoint. And the third proposed exhibit I'll call the Valo Timeline. If council needs any clarification as to which proposed exhibits I'm referencing, uh, let me know, otherwise I'll use those titles. So going forward, the court has reviewed some of the case law and the rules that would govern these exhibits. And Your Honor, I apologize for interrupting. There was one thing I was going to see if I could just clarify briefly for the record with regard to the Nick Edwards PowerPoint. Yes. There had been an indication that there were no police reports. I went back to verify there were approximately 26 police reports drafted or um, created by Mr. or Investigator Edwards in this matter. So I did just want to clarify that for the record. Okay. Thank you for the additional information on that, Ms. Blake. So the court first uh, looks at a couple of different rules, which I previously cited this morning, Rule 1006 allows summaries to prove content, and that indicates summaries may be used to prove the content of voluminous writings, recordings, or photographs that cannot be conveniently examined in court. And then I also had previously referenced the uh, rule that relates to a witness's ability to refresh their recollection, which I think is Rule 612 of the Idaho Rules of Evidence. Some of the uh, case law we've reviewed is not a state case, but an Idaho federal case, which is called United States versus Babichenko, which is B-A-B-I-C-H-E-N-K-O. That's 543 F sub 3rd, 946, a 2021 Idaho case. Some of the Case law in that case um, does go through an analysis of use of summary exhibits, and a few of the citations or quotes out of there is that uh, summary exhibits must be reasonably accurate and correct in their characterizations of the underlying materials, and also summary exhibits are distinct from pedagogical devices, which are helpful testimonial aids, but typically not admitted into evidence. And then also in that case, they talked about Quote, while a single item may appear innocuous in a vacuum, the government has repeatedly stressed the breadth of the alleged scheme and is entitled to present a comprehensive picture in its case in chief. That quotes a case, United States versus Daily, 974 F. 2nd, 1215. It says, moreover, these are exactly the kind of transactions that are best presented to the jury as Rule 1006 summaries, as it would be a waste of time to present the discrete actions and materials piece by piece. And that's, again, citing that Babichenko case. So there is precedent out there to allow a sort of summarizing witness, which the state is purporting to use here, to use a summary to detail or present what that case calls a comprehensive picture of its case in chief. Uh, the first exhibit then that's been proposed is the, what I'll refer to as the Nick Edwards PowerPoint. The defense has raised some argument to say it shouldn't be admitted. One is a timeliness argument, that it contains argument or it's argumentative, and that, that it's cumulative have been some of the points raised. The court would note that there's some additional case law that talks about uh, says the trial court should carefully examine summary charts, and here it would be this PowerPoint, to determine that everything contained in them is supported by the proof. And that's uh, out of a case called ABBAS, A-B-B-A-S, 730 
Fed second 1300. Um, so one of the issues here is the, back to the timeliness argument. Uh, is there time to carefully examine the entire summary and make sure everything in it is supported by the proof? Going through this Nick Edwards PowerPoint, um, there's some different issues I'll raise here that relate to that. Um, again, citing another case law, there's an admonition to guard against situation in which figures, computation, and charts acquire, quote, an existence of their own independent of the evidence which gave rise to them. Holland versus United States 348 U.S. 121. In the Edwards PowerPoint, there's multiple issues I've seen with that PowerPoint. First of all, it does, it just appears to be simply a, a closing argument PowerPoint. Um, there's editorialization within the PowerPoint. For example, there's a slide, which is slide number 49, and that slide 49 has a quotation in there, and it quotes, after it was suggested by coroner die that, and then it goes on to state uh, a quotation, and then it references a different officer's police report for that information, and that's a different officer that's already been in court and already testified. And so it cites directly from a report, which we wouldn't allow the testifying officer to do, and this is another officer that would come in and summarize what's, or quote from an officer's report, and under Rule 612, uh, even the officer on the stand wouldn't be allowed to do that. They would have to look at a report if they needed to refresh their recollection, but they would not be allowed to just quote from or read out of their report, which would be what is being sought in that particular slide. Um, slide 55 references witness interviews that are not in evidence. It quotes from interviews from Melanie Gibb, who's a witness who already came in and testified in trial, and it quotes directly statements she made, not in trial, statements she made in a pretrial interview. There are simply too many issues with the way that whole PowerPoint is put together. Uh, I find the entire thing essentially argumentative. It's not an officer testifying about facts they're aware of. It's basically prepackaged testimony in a presentation that the officer would go through step by step of pre-summarized and pre-written testimony, which uh, doesn't comply with Rule 403. I think that would be um, unfairly prejudicial to the defense to allow a witness to not just prepare testimony, but go in and put their testimony together in a multimedia presentation. Prosecutors get to do that. You get to tie all your evidence together in, in a closing argument. But that particular exhibit is uh, got enough issues. I don't think it can be reasonably corrected in order to uh, be submitted for, for uh, the jury to consider in this case. I think it goes directly against this admonition to guard against it becoming something different and have an existence of its own independent of evidence which gave rise to the creation of it. It even cites things that haven't even been submitted into evidence here. So looking through that, I'm not going to permit the Nick Edwards PowerPoint. Of course, the witness can testify and can testify to any material facts that he knows about that pertain to what's in the PowerPoint, um, but the PowerPoint itself is going to be disallowed based on what the courts reviewed in that. The next one we'll look at then, uh, I'll call the James Elena story PowerPoint, which consists of the verbatim, I guess, entire James Elena story that's been referenced here in court already by the witness today, and also has slides uh, attached to the end of the story. Again, the defense has raised objections on that PowerPoint, and the court has to consider, first of all, under Rule 403, whether or not um, that rule states that evidence may be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by a danger of one or more of the following. Unfair prejudice, confusing the issues, 
misleading the jury, undue delay, wasting time, or needlessly presenting cumulative evidence. So that particular exhibit I'll divide into two subparts. Part A would be all of the slides that are just the story itself. Part B are the accompanying following slides, of which there are five or six after the story. The witness this morning describing the story said it was a mix of fantasy and reality, that it has some relevance because it does tend to show actual events that coincided or matched some of the citations within the story. So the court has to consider whether there's enough relevance there. In looking at the story itself, and there's also been a cumulative argument, first there's a witness on the stand who's already cited to and read through parts of the story. And to have another witness come in and reread parts that have already been read into the record would be cumulative unnecessarily and needlessly under the rule. I think more importantly, reading into the record the entire story would go against Rule 403 because, number one, I do consider the wasting time part of 403. It's like a 35 slides worth of just a long story that is expressly indicated here as just part fantasy. To read the entire story into the record, if that's what the state intended, or publish it likewise to the jury would create a waste of time, needlessly cumulative evidence, and also maybe too confusing for the jury at that point if it's acknowledged that some of the story is fantasy. I think the jury is allowed to separate whether or not what was fantasy, what was reality. The witness can be allowed, whoever's going to proffer the exhibit, assuming it's admitted, then the witness can document or cite two particular sections in the story that do track actual events, if that's the state's theory. I would find that permissible. But reading the entire story into the record, I wouldn't find to be a wise use of the court's time and the juror's time as well. So I'll allow, if there's adequate foundation for the story in its entirety, to be submitted to the jurors as an exhibit, but I won't allow for the entire story to be read into the record. The witness can make reference to certain sections, point those out to the jurors, and if the jurors wish to delve further into the story in their deliberations, they would be provided a copy, and so they'd be allowed to reference that if they thought it was something relevant that they needed to consider in the deliberations. So that's the first part of that PowerPoint as to the story. The next part is the slides that come along with the end of the story, and the remaining slides I would not allow for several reasons. Again, going into these exhibits, I need to summarize evidence that's already in the case. Slide 35, for example, has multiple titles, has two different photographs. One was admitted into evidence. One's never been admitted into evidence. It makes argumentative type comments, so that slide I wouldn't allow. Slide 36 has another photograph that's never been admitted into evidence in the case, and slide 37 as well, and contains argumentative language such as substantiation, which is the provenance of the jury to decide whether or not something is substantiated or not. So again, it's not just a summary of evidence. It's argumentative in nature, and then there's a separate chart also included within the summary, and the information in that chart would likely be admissible, but there's also some highlighting within that, and the case law indicates that it's also not fair within these charts if they're summarizing evidence to emphasize certain parts of the evidence and not other parts. That, again, goes into arguments. So on the James and Elena story PowerPoint, the court will not allow the PowerPoint to be an exhibit. However, the story itself can be admitted, assuming there's adequate foundation to do that, and if there are other objections when it's offered, I'll take those up at the time. 
and the jurors may have a copy, hard copy for an exhibit, but not the PowerPoint. That would be the ruling then on that. The final exhibit then is the timeline. And on the timeline, the court has reviewed that, and it appears it comports with evidence that's been previously admitted and would be an appropriate uh, summary under Rule 1006 from what I've seen at this point. The only uh, required modifications to that would be certain slides are highlighted in colors with uh, like red or green, I think maybe yellow, and, and they stand out. And again, I think it's improper to emphasize certain parts of the evidence. I think that's for argument and for the jurors. And there are a few references in there, such as the word presumably. There was a text presumably to Chad. Um, that, again, goes to argument. So if any of those editorial type references would be removed and the emphasizing colors that are in there, there's I think maybe five or six. There's not that many. But other than that, I don't see a reason why the timeline would not uh, meet the requirements under Rule 1006 and 403 to be admissible, provided there's adequate foundation. So with those modifications, the court will consider allowing its admission. So that's the ruling I have as to the three exhibits. Um, the defense made the objection. Mr. Archibald, do you have any questions on the court's ruling? All right, thank you. Any questions from the state? Just want to clarify a few things to make sure that I have it clear. On the James and Elena exhibit, the court would allow the PowerPoint of just the story to be submitted as a written exhibit. Is that correct? Yeah. So instead of PowerPoint, just print it off. And then take off the last slides, the Part B that the court referenced? Yes. And then with regard to the Nick Edwards exhibit, that was a PowerPoint. The court has indicated that would not be allowed. You referenced specific slides. If the state wanted to use individual slides as separate exhibits, would that potentially be allowed depending on the ruling of the court? Some I could, of the slides wouldn't contain the what had been concerning to the court would be the state's position. Okay. And I, I didn't mean to – the list I gave was not – an inclusive list. It was just a few I pointed out. I saw issues with most of it, um, if not all of it. There may be specific slides or there are information within those slides that I think is admissible. It's just the form and how it was presented I think does come across uh, as argument. And so I'm not ruling out the content within many of those slides to be permissible. It's just the way uh, it didn't really create a summary. It was essentially tying together argument just like just like the prosecution would in a closing argument. So uh, if there are other slides you want to use separately and you think they wouldn't uh, fall within those same concerns, I could take those up on an ad hoc basis if they're proffered by the state. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. There were just a few uh, that I don't think contained much write, written content, uh, just more charts, some graphs, things of that nature that the state may request or attempt to admit. Just wanted to make sure that the whole thing was not prohibited as to individual slides necessarily. Okay, and I would agree with your uh, interpretation of my ruling there. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Okay, that will conclude the issue on those proposed <coughs> items of evidence then. With that in mind, we're going we, let's have the uh, jurors brought in. We can continue with evidence.
Here's our President of Counterpoint, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, we're back on the record on Case CR 22-211624 after the lunch break. Appreciate the patience of the jurors. We were taking up some matters outside of your presence before we got started again with additional testimony. Ms. Smith continues with direct examination of... That's fine. That's fine. Okay. The state's got that sorted out now, so we'll continue with your direct examination of the agent. I'll remind the witness you're still under testimony for your oath. I'm sorry, you're still under oath for your testimony today. And with that in mind, Ms. Smith, if you'd like to continue with your direct, you may. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's turn to some chat or information that you included in your summary between Lori Vallow and Sidney Woodbury. Can you take a look at slide 72? And I believe this part of the chat goes through slide 73. Correct. Okay. Why did you include this particular chat session in the summary you prepared? I included this because of two reasons. First, it shows efforts that were made to hire a caregiver for J.J. by Lori Vallow in mid-September. And then in terms of the timing of the last known video that exists of J.J. Vallow, that video coincides with the latter half of this particular chat. Now, I notice at the top of slide 72, it says there are 26 total messages. Did you put all 26 in the slides? No. Okay. Why not? Due to the need to convey what's being talked about without overburdening this process with every single message. Okay. And so just so we're clear, the idea of a summary is to take the highlights, put it in, but the original is still available. Correct. Okay. So could you do us a favor and read slide 72 and 73 into the record, please? Yes. This is chat number six from Sidney Woodbury to Lori Vallow on September 18th, 2019. Hi, Lori. This is Sidney Woodbury from care.com. I just received your message and think your little boy sounds so sweet. I actually have worked with kids in the past with autism at a behavior science company and used positive behavior therapy to help them. I love playing with kids and doing fun things. What are the hours you are thinking of as well as hourly rate? I am currently attending school, so I hope I can help out with the hours you're needing. Response from Lori Vallow to Sidney Woodbury. That's so great. I'm thinking $15 an hour. I'm flexible with time. He gets out of school at 2.30 every day, so a few hours a week after school. We could work around your schedule as far as days of the week and then some time on Saturdays. Again from Lori Vallow. We live on Pioneer Road, only a few minutes from campus. Do you want to come meet us? And if you could complete the chat that's reflected on slide 73. Yes. From Sidney Woodbury to Lori Vallow. Yes, I'd love to. Again from Sidney Woodbury. Am I good to come over? 
from Lori Vallow to Sydney Woodbury. Sure, we are here from Lori Vallow to Sydney Woodbury, picking up JJ now, excited to see you today. From Sydney Woodbury to Lori Vallow, okay, I'm heading over now. And so there was an, I understand you said the significance of this was an effort to hire somebody to assist with JJ. Did I hear that right? Yes. Okay. What was the last known sighting again, just for a reference, of Tylee Vallow, Ty, Tylee Ryan alive? September 8th, 2019. Based on your review of the communications from Lori Vallow with others and that information in context, prior to September 8th of 2019, was Tylee a resource in helping care for JJ? Yes. Okay. Um, what sort of communications did you have that support that um, conclusion that Tylee helped care for her brother? There were lots of texts uh, related th throughout the review of the iCloud related to Tylee uh, helping to take care of JJ when Lori Vallow had errands to run or needed to um, be absent from the home for some reason or another. Okay. And prior to Tylee, um, Tylee's disappearance, had Lori had all, any other support or infrastructure in caring for JJ? Yes. While they lived in Phoenix, there was a woman named Angela who worked for a company that uh, Lori Vallow had uh, a contract with to have a certain number of hours each week of care provided for JJ. Okay. Were there, uh, um, prior to Charles Vallow's death, did he have any role in helping care for JJ? Of course. He, he cared for JJ frequently as well. Okay. And so after September 8th and the move to Rexburg, what infrastructure of support could you find for Lori Vallow to help her care for JJ? This was the only reference I found. Okay. And so um, based on your review of the iCloud record and videos and chats and all the records you told us you looked at, was JJ an easy child to care for and uh, raise? Not at all. He had uh, severe autism, and and so um, he was a challenging young child. So by September eighteenth, um, by September eighteenth, who was the primary, almost sole caregiver for JJ Vallow? Lori Vallow. Okay. Is there any other reason why you included this chat? Um, session with Sydney Woodbury in the iCloud summary you prepared? Just in context with the back half of this chat. Okay. And when you say back half of this chat, are we talking slide 73? No. Okay. Slide 75 and 6. Okay. Well, let's go to slide 74. What are we looking at here? This is from the video section of Lori for Style at iCloud.com, and this is just a very brief uh, video, but it is the last known video of J.J. Vallow while he was alive, and it was taken on September 22nd of 2019. Prior to September 22nd of 2019, were there other videos of J.J. Vallow? Lots of them. Okay. After September 22nd of 2019, in Lori's, any of Lori's um, electronic data, did you find any videos or pictures of J.J. Vallow? No. And so when you say the back half of this communication, are we talking about what's reflected on fly, slide 75? Yes. Okay. Um, can you read slide 75 into the record, please? Yes. Continuation of chat number six from Sydney Woodbury to Lori Vallow on September 24th, 2019. 
Hi, Lolo. Are we still good for me coming today? From Lori Vallow to Sydney Woodbury. Hi, Sydney. I hope the wedding was good. So JJ's grandparents came this weekend, and they took him for a few weeks to give me a break. So he won't be back until probably the end of October. I wish I had other work for you to do. You are such a darling girl. I understand if you need to get another job. From Lori Vallow to Sydney Woodbury. Of course. I'm not sure when he'll be back, but I'm going to do some traveling while he's gone, probably to see my friends in Hawaii, but I'll let you know for sure when we are both back in Rexburg. You are great. Now, did this text communication proceed after that date? There were some additional uh, messages, yes. But not on September 24th? Correct. Okay. Now, the weekend of September... 21st, 22nd, and the morning of the 23rd, had Lori had visitors? Yes. Who were those visitors? Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. Okay. And in, um, did you find any evidence whatsoever that JJ's grandparents had been in Rexburg September 21st, 22nd, or 23rd? No. Let's turn to slide 76. Why did you include this SMS section from Lori for Style in your summary? This is a significant text string between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell that talks very specifically about Tammy Daybell's pending death. Okay. Could you read for us? Uh, you want to? Let's. Could you read for us slide 76 and 77 into the record? Yes. Thank you. Line 810 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Good night, Angel Lily. So excited to go on our date. Line 782 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. We are supposed to go on a real date tonight, but we are discussing it. Perhaps an evening at home would be better, so we are not out and about. I'll let you know but you could come and sing with us after your shower. Line 773, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Hello, sweet angel. Big news about Tammy. Please let me know if you are awake and can talk. I love you. And what's on 77? Line 772, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. The short version is that she has been switched. Tammy is in limbo, and a level three demonic entity named Viola is in her body. It happened about 10 p.m. and was done by Tammy's sister, Sam, who I always knew was 3D, but it turns out she is multiple creation. Line 771 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Viola has been attached for about a year to my niece, Danica, who is Sam's 12-year-old daughter. I have connected with Tammy in limbo, and she is very frustrated and upset. She wants Viola removed as soon as possible. Viola seems to be similar to Penelope. The personality differences from Tammy should be evident quickly. Please seek a confirmation on this, but I have now checked three times since I got home and get more affirmative answers each time. And if we may, could we proceed to read line 78 as well? Yes. Line 770 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Sam is much like Brandon. She has been my biggest enemy over the years. She refuses to read my books and threw the biggest fit when we moved to Idaho. She has only visited us when the kids got married and always fled Idaho within hours, like she was being burned. She's definitely comparable to Brandon and Summer. Line 769, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Not fully sure of the timing for removal, but once her actions verify the differences, I don't want to wait. If I may ask a, a couple of questions, um, 
about that text communication. Um, are you aware of the date that Brandon Boudreaux was shot at? I am. What date was Brandon Boudreaux shot at? October 2nd of 2019. Okay. Are you aware of the date that Tammy Daybell was shot at by a, someone in her driveway? I am. What date was she shot at? October 9th of 2019. Okay. Now, um, and so at this point of this text communication in the late evening hours of October 3rd to the early morning hours uh, or the, the daytime hours of October 5th, was Tammy Daybell still alive? Yes. Okay. So can you help us understand um, what uh, a real date means in context of the timeline and the text exchange we, you've read to us? Yes. Lori Vallow and her children moved to Rexburg the first part of September of 2019. Based on the investigation, both children were killed in September of 2019. Now in the early part of October, there's a reference to going on a real date out in public. Rexburg is a small town, and so that is problematic for Chad Daybell still being married to Tammy Daybell. And so by this date, um, Lori Vallow is uh, unencumbered and fully free. Correct. But Chad Daybell is not. Correct. And um, and so was there any information that would suggest that Lori wanted to go on a real date? That's what she stated to Alex Cox on October 4th. Okay. And so was there any significance uh, to you in context of the iCloud in the review where he talks about big news to Tammy, about Tammy, please let me know if you're awake and talk, can talk? Yes, within 12 hours of the text regarding going on a real date, Chad Daybell now has big news about Tammy, and that news was that she's in limbo because her body's been inhibited by a level three demonic entity named Viola. Okay. Turning to the, some of the texts that are on slide 77, um, just so I'm clear, the text from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow is asking her to seek confirmation? Correct. Okay. And so Chad is seeking Lori's opinion? Correct. And turning to the text on slide 78, who is it who is discussing timing for removal? That's a text from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Okay. And was there any indication that at this point Lori Vallow protested, said anything in any way in opposition to a timing for removal and not wanting to wait? No. Before we move to the next text, is there anything else on that text communication between the two about the entity inside of Tammy and not wanting to wait that you wish to review? No. Okay. Turning to a text communication with Lori Vallow and Melanie Boudreau reflected on slide 79 and 80, why did you include these two slides? I included these slides because they contain uh, travel information for Lori Vallow and uh, show that she was traveling out of state uh, during the first attempt on Tammy's life, which took place on October 9th of 2019. Okay. So the previous texts with Chad about not wanting to wait were on or about October 5th, correct? October 4th and October 5th. Okay. And then um, the first attempt on Tammy's life with the shooter in the driveway was October 9th. Correct. October 7th, um, is that some of the text communications we see in slide 79 and slide 80? Yes. Could you please read those into the record? Line 729 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. I'm really feeling like we need to go to Missouri and work. Maybe we can fly there on Thursday and back on SAT. Line 728 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. 
American has a nonstop flight PHX to Kansas City Thursday at 1 p.m., then fly back on SAT at 6.30 p.m. Audrey said we could stay with her, but I told her we could get a hotel and she could stay with us. She will take us to all the amazing sites. And uh, slide 80, please. Line 726, from Melanie Boudreaux to Lori Vallow. What about Brandon not being able to take the kids to it? Does Dad think I will need to be here? Line 725 from Melanie Boudreaux to Lori Vallow to Utah. Line 724 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreaux. Nope, you need to be unavailable. That is the schedule. Line 723 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. Okay, Captain. Uh, can you help us understand the significance of this text messaging in context of your summary? It simply illustrates that Lori Vallow made travel arrangements and was not present in Idaho during the first attempt on Tammy Daybell's life. Um, and it, there's a, a reference in on slide 80, line 7, 23 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. Okay, Captain. Do you see that? I do. Did you see any other evidence of Lori Vallow giving direction or instruction to Melanie Boudreau on what to do or how to do or when to do things? Yes, I saw that on a number of occasions. Okay. Did you see that same sort of um, what to do, how to do it, sort of, okay, captain, instructions given to other people within their group of uh, friends. The only other one would be to Alex Cox. Now, turning to line 81, I uh, slide 81, I apologize. Um, can you tell us why you included this text exchange between Audrey Bautario and Lori Vallow? Yes, this is a text string uh, between Audrey Baratario and Lori Vallow, wherein Audrey Baratario makes an inquiry about Lori Vallow and C. Chad Daybell working regarding Tammy Daybell. Okay. Could you please read slide 81 in? Line 669 from Audrey Baratario to Lori Vallow. How did yesterday go? Line 668 from Audrey Baratario to Lori Vallow, with U and C working. Line 667, from Lori Vallow to Audrey Baratario. Well, we did a lot of work today. We got her out, but a new one got in, so we are still working on it. Audrey, any ideas you have would be greatly appreciated. Line 666, from Audrey Baratario to Lori Vallow. Okay. Now, I realize we haven't had you reading the different emojis that the jury can see, but do you see the emoji that's at the end of Audrey Baratario to Lori Vallow? I do. Um, in your experience, what does the um, face with the two eyes X'd out I don't object to any, any characterization of this judge. That's without foundation sustained. Okay. Have you had experience in looking up and reviewing various suspects' communications back and forth? Yes. Okay. Does that include review of what emojis are included in their text communications? Sometimes. Okay. Do you have any um, experience in looking up the um, emoji with the face and the eyes X out? Yes. In your research and your review of this iCloud account, what did the face with the eyes X out Signify. Again, I'm going to object to mischaracterization. It's too speculative. Overruled. It can be associated with death. Okay. Why did you include this text communication um, in your uh, summary exhibit supplied? Because of the inquiry uh, regarding Tammy Daybell, particularly in light of the date of these communications, which is subsequent to the first attempt on Tammy Daybell's life. Okay. And what day did Tammy Day what what day was Tammy Daybell killed? 
October 19th of 2019. So this text communication between Audrey and Lori was between the attempted shooting and the day she was killed? Correct. Is there anything else of significance you would like to review on slide 81? No. Turning to slide 82, um, why did you include this series of communications between Lori Vallow and Melanie Boudreau? I included this for context purposes because it is a similar conversation relating to Brandon Boudreau with references for uh, could he go uh, similar to what we've seen in other communications. Okay. Uh, could you please read into the record slides 82 and 83? Yes. Line 663 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. Yeah, but until that agreement is signed by the judge, it is all subject to change. That's probably the reason for the delay. Line 662 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. Is there a possibility he could go before I move? Line 661 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. There's always that possibility. We will work on it. Just have faith and do whatever the Lord tells you. He is always right. Line 655 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. I don't recall the words to get him out, but should we try? And then turning to slide 83. Line 654 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. I know them. I'll work on it now. Put all your energy in. Line 647 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. I've worked on them all day and evening. Line 646 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. Me too. He's got to be ready to go. Line 645 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. I know. Okay. Is there anything else you want to review with the jury on why you included the text communication between Melanie Boudreau and Lori Vallow from October 14, 2019? No. Turning to text communication from October 19th, 2019, why did you include these SMS messages from Lori for Style? These are messages to Lori Vallow informing her of Tammy Daybell's death while Lori Vallow was traveling in Hawaii. Okay. And so at this point, Lori Vallow was in Hawaii. Do you know who she was in Hawaii with? She was there with... Uh, Melanie Boudreau initially, and then Audrey Baratario flew over and joined them uh, some days after Lori Vallow and Melanie Boudreau had arrived. Okay. Um, if you could please read into the record slide 84. Line 541. From unknown individual to Lori Vallow. I'm not sure if you heard, but Chad's wife died last night. Line 540, from Lori Vallow to unknown individual. Oh my gosh, I did not hear that. I'm in Hawaii and it's 6 a.m. Line 539, from Lori Vallow to unknown individual. Do you know what happened? Line 538, from unknown individual to Lori Vallow. Yes, she awoke in the night coughing, threw up, collapsed, and passed away. Why did you include this series of text communications specifically um, from the morning of October 19th? Due to its relevance in the death of Tammy Daybell. Okay. Did you have reason to believe that Lori had learned other ways uh, in another manner of Tammy Daybell's death? There's nothing in the iCloud to indicate that. Let's turn to text communication from October 19th um, with Chad Daybell. Can you please read slides 85 into the record? Yes. Line 532 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Not fun without you. Can you call me? Line 531 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. How are you doing is the question. Line 530 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I'm hanging in there. My parents are staying here, and we are still getting visitors, but I will call you soon. 
Why did you include this, these text? Subsequent to Tammy Daybell's death on October 19th, 2019, there's a flurry of text messages between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell that are insightful as to the nature of the relationship between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow and their subsequent plans now that Tammy Daybell is dead. Turning to slide 86, could you read that one into the record? Yes. Line 528, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow, percentage in body, whole sore 24, Bucola 11, Grisone 14. Line 527, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow, great job on lowering them. I loved talking with you. It is baby night, so come get me later. Line 526, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow, missing you so much. I can feel you in bed with me, though. Can't wait to truly hold you tightly every day and night. Line 525, from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell, I'm missing you more. I need you desperately. I can't wait. So this text communication happens around um, just after midnight on the 20th through around 7 in the morning on October 20th, 2019, correct? Yes. Uh, less than 24 hours after Tammy Daybell dies? Roughly 24 hours, yes. Okay. Um, any other significance to this particular slide? No. Okay. Moving towards um, the next series of communication from on the 20th, why did you include slide 87? These are a continuation. This slide and probably the next two are, are a continuation of that text string between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Okay. Could you please read in slide 87 and then we'll move to 88 and 89. Line 524 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Need you to hold me tight. That would be great. What about the idea of you coming here Thursday or Friday? Or do you want me to come home? Line 523 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Their apartment is haunted and we can't clear the place. So they are looking to move anyway. And I have the perfect place for them. I need to be here to get sorting the financial stuff. And I truly need your help. So please come home Thursday so we can spend the night together. Then, as soon as I have things under control, we can return. I seriously want you to look for a condo for us while you are there that we could return to at the first of the month. And um, please read slide 88. Line 518 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I want to get going full steam on the Lilly workout plan. Tighten the abs, get a full body tan, grow my hair out. This could be really good for both of us. Line 517 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. I love that plan. It's not soon enough, though. This is torture. Maybe you need to clear my mind so I can't remember how much I love you. Line 516 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I will try, but it feels like Raphael and Lily are together at about 100%. Not sure it will ever be lower again. And if you could read slide 89. Line 515, from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. That's true. I do feel you. I feel lovesick. I can't sleep. I don't want to eat. I just want you. It's so consuming. Line 514, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I know exactly how you feel. I'm feeling sad, but it isn't for the reason everyone thinks. And the I'm feeling sad, but it isn't for the reason everyone thinks was 8 in the morning on October 20th, 2019. Correct. Okay. In terms of those three slides and that text communication, is there anything else of significance you wish to cover? No, I don't think so. Okay.
turning to slide 90. This, why did you include this text communication between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell? This short text string between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell is extremely important in that Lori Vallow expresses a concern to Chad Daybell regarding Alex Cox. Can you please read into the record slide 90? Line 482 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. I had a bad dream about Al. Make sure he is still him and protect him. Line 481, from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. He would be the one they used to get to us both. All this alone time is not good for him. Line 479, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I will try to reach out to him later today. Line 471, from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. I just cleared all of Al's weapons, curses, and cords and filled him with malachite healing balm. I also put angels around him. And if you could read slide 91. This is a slide from the notes section of Lori for Style, line 161. Alex Cox, multiple creation, fourth creation exalted nine times, sibling to me two times on fourth creation, Rose is exalted, married three times on fourth creation, and became eternal companions after fourth creation. His mission is to help Lori. Okay. So the exchange between Lori and Chad about Alex, why did you include that specifically? I included it because of the reference to Al and him being the one they would use to get to both Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. And the date of that exchange was October 23rd, 2019? Yes. Okay. Do you know the date that Alex Cox passed away? Oh, boy. <laughs> December. I want to say December 12th, but I, I'm i sorry. I can't recall that exact date. That's okay. Early December, beginning of December. December 2nd would be the next date that comes to my mind. But again, I can't recall clearly. I know it's December of 2019. Fair enough. And so um, in October, there's a text communication about Al being the one that would get to them. Correct? That Al would be the one they used to get to us both. Um, do you have any information about when Alex Cox, did Alex Cox subsequently marry someone from this group? Yes. Okay. Who did he marry after this date? Uh, Zulima Pestentes. Okay. And then sometime in, towards the beginning or the couple, first couple weeks of December, Alex Cox is dead. Correct. Okay. And then um, why did you include the notes section of Lori for Style on Alex Cox? This contains some of the religious concepts that uh, were pertinent to this investigation, but mainly for the last line, that his mission is to help Lori. Okay. Now, when you say it relates to the religious concepts and specifically about Alex Cox's job to help Lori, um, what was that based on in terms of your review of the iCloud? During the review of the iCloud, there's voluminous information regarding the religious beliefs of Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Uh, and this is one note that contains references to some of those things. Okay. And um, did you see through your review of the various iCloud accounts and emails and information in the iCloud accounts for Lori Vallow any sort of definition of Alex Cox's role in this religious um, group of friends? One of the main references was that his mission in life was to protect and to help his sister, Lori. Okay. And within the communications of the iCloud that you reviewed, um, the communications between Lori and Chad and Alex and others, did you find any evidence that Alex believed that his mission was to help and protect Lori? Yes. Okay. Now, turning to slide um, 
92. I see that it, it appears to be a text between Lori Vallow and Mel Melanie Boudreau. Correct. Okay. Could you please read slide 92 into the record? Line 175 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. Will you do this job if your whole family turns against you? That is what the Lord has asked of us. Our glories will be worth it, and they will all shrink in our presence. It will be a sad day for those who choose to oppose us when we work for the Lord and are his valiant warriors. Be strong, my little one. We will be gone in a few. Why did you include this particular text message to Melanie Boudreau in uh, the iCloud summary? I included this because it is illustrative of Lori Vallow's beliefs and the statement that she made to Melanie Boudreau, who was part of this group. And what particular statement? The, the entirety of the text, I believe, is her statement. Okay. Is there anything else of significance for that particular text? No. Okay. Now, in your review of the iCloud, did you also see videos in the iCloud? Hundreds of them. Okay. And I think you've told us you saw videos and emails and documents, hundreds and if not thousands of documents. Yes. Okay. Um, did you find um, any documentation of a patriarchal blessing given to Alex Cox by Chad Debo? Yes, that was found uh, in the iCloud. Um, Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be given State's Exhibit 50A, um, a courtesy copy of which has already been given the court. All right. And is that, I think that's previously admitted? That patriarchal blessing was the recording um, that was done, I believe, um, but 50 itself, 50A is the written copy from the iCloud. It, it should be admitted as part of 29, but we pulled that specific document out and gave it its own number, 50A. All right, would there be any objection to the admission of 50A that's being offered? Yes, Your Honor, it's cumulative. Response? Um, Your Honor, it is not cumulative. A recording was played for the jury. The written copy found in the iCloud has not been provided. All right, I've considered Rule 403. Do not find it's needlessly cumulative, so it can be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. May the witness be shown it? Yes. Thank you just so that he can look at it. Thank you, sir. Okay. 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 Did you get a chance to look at it? Yes. That's a copy of the patriarchal blessing yeah. you found in the iCloud? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, did you review this document? I have, yes. Okay. Are you aware of what a patriarchal blessing is? I am, yes. What is a patriarchal blessing? In the LDS faith, it's a blessing that uh, faithful members receive at one point in their life to... Uh, provide a spiritual guide for them. Okay. And um, this has already been read into the record, so we're not going to. I'm not going to ask the witness to do that again. But um, who is allowed to give a patriarchal blessing within the um, LDS faith? I don't object, Your Honor. I don't think he has the proper uh, foundation to be able to say that. If you know. Do, do you know who's allowed to give a patriarchal blessing within the LDS Church? I do. Who is allowed? Again, Judge, I don't think he has a proper foundation to discuss. He, he needs to explain how that foundation is if he's going to testify to that fact. How do you know who's allowed to give a patriarchal blessing within the LDS Church? I am uh, familiar with this process and who is called within the church to give these blessings. Okay. And um, have you also researched and, and looked into some of those processes and procedures? Yes. Okay. 
so again, who's allowed to um, give a patriarchal blessing? Again, Judge, I'm going to object. I don't think he has the the, the credentials to, to to talk about this. Well, he just laid a foundation that's adequate for the court to consider, so I'll overrule the objection at this point. Thank you. Within each geographic stake in the LDS faith, there is one individual who is called to be a patriarch. That one individual is the person who administers these blessings. Okay. And did you find any evidence in your review of the iCloud in any of the evidence or any of the interviews or the temple records from the LDS church that Chad Debell was authorized by the LDS church to give a patriarchal blessing? No. Okay. Now, that patriarchal blessing in States Exhibit 58A um, is um, a written patriarchal blessing from who? It states from uh, Patriarch Chad Daybell. Okay. To whom? Alexander Lamar Cox. Okay. What, if any, significance do States Exhibits 50A have to you in context of your review of the iCloud and the evidence as a whole? There were a couple of phrases that were used during this blessing as it relates to Alex Cox's mission to protect uh, Lori Vallow and a few other lines that indicated things that Alex Cox had done that I believed were pertinent to this investigation. What lines are those? In the third paragraph of the Patriarchal Blessing, about halfway down, it states, great warriors were needed in that creation. Powerful goddesses needed to be protected, and you were selected to help protect your sister. You helped her in numerous probations as a defender. You have a special bond with her, even from the premortal world. You connected there, and as she grew in power, you were right there beside her, always with a humble heart. Why was that significant to you? Alex Cox was part of this group. He was close to Chad Daybell and close to Lori Vallow. And Lori Vallow had made statements to Chad Daybell in text messages that Alex Cox would be the one they would use to get to both Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Uh, objection, Your Honor. I think that misstates what's, what was actually written in the text. I'll overrule that objection. And so in context of the investigation, why did those things matter? In the totality of the investigation, Alex Cox had a role in the events that took place. <laughs> and was there additional information in um, the next paragraph, paragraph four? Yes. What information stood out to you? In the last sentence it states, you have already assisted us in ways that can never be repaid, but you will continue to do so as you move forward in this life. Okay. Why did that particular um, statement stick out to you in context of your review of the iCloud and all of the evidence? It is a direct reference by Chad Daybell regarding Alexander Cox stating that he has assisted them in ways that can, quote, never be repaid. Okay. And in that document, did there, there appear to be any um, evidence of forgiveness or dispensation of grace? Yes. Can you tell us about that? That's in the sixth paragraph. Uh, there's a sentence which states, throughout adulthood you have refined yourself, and I want you to know that the Savior is saying to you at this time, well done, thy soul is cleansed, and all is well. Is there anything else about the patriarchal blessing that stuck out to you in terms of the investigation and its connection to the iCloud? Just one more sentence in the next paragraph. Which is? It states... 
You will be a powerful servant. I bless you with that knowledge that you will now move forward as a true warrior, not only through physical action, but through spiritual power that will be bestowed upon you. And why did that stand out to you? The reference to physical action. Okay. Now, um, you've mentioned several texts about the Lori, uh, the relationship between Chad and Lori. Um, did that result in multiple efforts to follow up on that relationship and its connections to the crimes against Tylee, JJ, and Tammy? Yes. Okay. You mentioned several texts and communications and emails uh, reflecting a need for money or a monetary value. Um, did that um, communication about money as and need for money and life insurance money have any significance for investigative follow-up? It did. And did officers take those steps? Yes. You also mentioned that the electronic data and the evidence that you possessed um, um, and researched uh, reflected a relationship and perhaps an agreement between Alex, Chad, and Lori. Why was that significant to you in terms of the investigation and items um, and directives you gave? That was a long question. If you need me to rephrase, I can. Do that one again. You indicated, based on your review of the electronic information in the iCloud and instructions you gave to others, that the evidence of a relationship or an agreement between Alex and Chad and Lori was significant. Correct. Why? Well, from the beginning, it was clear that the relationship between the romantic relationship between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow was the driving force behind the crimes that are alleged to have taken place. And Alex Cox had a role in assisting for those things to happen. You also discussed that there were several messages or planning for the future. Um, Any idea how many? Several. Why is the presence in um, the defendant's own words of planning for the future or um, wanting to be together, why is that significant in terms of the investigative um, efforts you directed? Because it's evidence that's directly generated by Lori Vallow. Okay. Now, you've talked about um, various items um, Were there other items in the iCloud reflecting anything that had been deleted? Was there evidence of items deleted but not gone in either Lolly Time or Lori for Style? Yes, there are deleted texts, meaning deleted off of the device, off of the phone, but they're present in the iCloud. Okay. Did some of those... um, uh, ta- chats or items in the, the deleted section include chats or attempted chats with Kay Woodcock. I'm sorry, could you that? Did some of the deleted information include deleted chats with Kay Woodcock? I'm not sure if they were deleted or not. There were messages from Kay Woodcock to Lori Vallow regarding wanting to FaceTime JJ or to have JJ attend Charles Vallow's funeral service, but I don't know if those were deleted. Okay. Did you see any evidence that Lori had um, responded to any of those? No. Okay. Now, um, prior to September 8th of 2019, did you see instances of Tylee uh, Ryan, a teenager, texting or communicating with her mother? Yes. Um, after September 8th of 2019, did you see any evidence of texting or communication between Chad and Lori? Between Chad and Lori? I'm sorry, Tylee and Lori. No. Okay. Let's talk about other things to see whether they were there or they were missing. Prior to September 18th, did Lori Vallow's iCloud accounts reflect pictures of the children? Yes. Um, did they reflect emails? Of or about the children? Some. Okay. Did they reflect messages of the children? There were a lot of messages about the day-to-day activities, uh, primarily 
JJ to a, to a lesser amount, Tylee. But yes, those were present. And prior to September of 2019, were there videos of the children? Yes. Okay. After September 8th of 2019, did you see evidence of the um, Tylee, uh, either through pictures, emails, messages, or videos? Nothing after September 8th. Okay. What about, um, as to JJ, what about after September 22nd, or the morning of the 23rd, did you see any evidence of JJ in the pictures, the emails, the messages, the videos? No. Okay. Was that a stark contrast to what was before September? Yes, very stark. Okay. Um, now, in your review of the iCloud, that's f that winter and spring of 2019, did you see any messaging about Lori attempting to just divorce Charles? No, there were a total of two text messages regarding a divorce between Lori Vallow and Charles Vallow. The first was in February of 2019 and was a message from Lori Vallow's bishop indicating Charles Vallow was going to serve her with divorce papers. And the second message was from Charles Vallow to Lori Vallow on June 29, 2000. 19 indicating he intended to divorce Lori Vallow. Both of those messages were from other people to Lori Vallow regarding a possible divorce. Okay. Did you see any evidence in any of Lori's um, information or the search history or the text messages or the messaging that Lori searched for a divorce attorney? No. I want to object to this. This is 404B. Give me just a minute to think about that objection, counsel. Which part? You've already had some testimony come in, Mr. Thomas, and without going too much into a speaking objection, what in particular about that question you think relates to 404B? A anything about the divorce? It has nothing to do with anything that we're dealing with today. And under 403, I would also object. Response. Your Honor, the, the state's um, evidence has shown that there was, um, throughout the different charged conspiracies, there was a motive, a consistent motive running throughout them that Lori Vallow needed her spouse gone but not divorced. Okay, and Ms. Smith, just in generalities for the... Right. Religion. It reflects motive, intent, absence of mistake to commit the crimes that she's charged with. All right, counsel, could I have a quick sidebar? Sure. All right, counsel, I considered the ruling, had a brief sidebar there. I've considered the ruling under both Rules of Evidence 403 and 404B. I'll uh, overrule the objection on 404B, finding that wouldn't apply in this particular instance. And 403, I've considered that rule as well and will overrule the objection on relevance grounds so the witness can Answer that question, if we could perhaps have it read back into the record, Madam Reporter. No, I did not. Okay. Your Honor, I have probably 10 or 15 more minutes. Do we want to take our break now? I think so. Okay. Why don't we do that? Um, we'll go ahead and take the mid-afternoon break and resume here 20 till or quarter till. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, please.
Thank you. Please be seated. Get up the jurors brought back, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record after the afternoon break. KCR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. The jurors are all present and properly seated. Ms. Smith, if you'd like to continue with your direct examination, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Agent, um, a couple quick questions. In the multiple email messages, data review, iCloud accounts that you looked at, about um, and with the messages referencing JJ, Tylee, and Tammy being dark and having death percentages at zero, did you ever see an objection from Lori Vallow? No. Did you ever see anything other than Lori Vallow aiding and encouraging that conversation? No. Okay. Now, turning towards um, what you outlined um, a bit last week, it's my understanding that law enforcement and the FBI brought a tremendous amount of resources to bear on this investigation. Yes. From November of 2019, to June of 2020, did the FBI and law enforcement ever stop looking for J.J. and Tylee? No. Why not? That is the posture that you have to take in a missing child case, that you always hope for the best outcome and work as tirelessly as possible until the case is resolved. Okay. And in this situation, Looking at all of the messaging and communication that Lori Vallow had, did you ever see any evidence that um, J.J. Vallow was alive after September of 2019? No. 
did you ever see any evidence that Lori was looking for him or trying to support him or help him after September 22nd, 2019? No. As for Tylee, did you ever see after September 8th of 2019 in any of her email accounts, any of the information, her text message, that Lori Vallow was looking for her? No. Did you ever find any evidence that Lori Vallow had that Tylee was alive after September 8th of 2019? No. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Thomas, will you be doing cross? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Thomas, you can inquire. Thank you. Just a little while ago, we were talking about patriarchal blessings, and you indicated that you didn't find any evidence that Chad was able to give a patriarchal blessing. Is that, is that a true statement? Yes. Okay. What evidence were you looking for? That he would hold that calling in the LDS faith. Okay. And so did you contact church headquarters about that? I did not. Did you contact his bishop about that? I know we had contact. Did you, uh, no, that's just a yes or no question. Okay, no. Okay. Um, did you contact, so you didn't talk to his bishop, you didn't talk to uh, church headquarters. Did you talk to any of the 70 or any, anybody in authority with regards to him being a patriarch? Me personally, no, I did not. Okay. So when the state asked you if you found any evidence that Chad was able to give a patriarchal blessing and you said no, you really didn't do any research on that, right? No, that's not correct. Okay. Explain that. We knew from the context. Who's we? I knew. Objection, Your Honor. May the witness be allowed to answer his question? Oh, he cut him off. Uh, it's overruled because he started with we, and I think that's worth clarifying. So, Mr. Thomas, you can continue. Who is we? I'll clarify. I knew from the investigation that Chad Daybell was called as a ward clerk. His calling in the LDS faith was not that of a patriarch. Okay. Who did you speak to about that? I didn't speak to anybody about it. It was contained in conversations and interviews and other investigative efforts that took place. So you didn't talk to anybody with regards to him being a patriarch. You just made that assumption. Objection. Compound question. Overruled. Based on the totality of the investigation, to my knowledge, Chad Daybell is not a patriarch. Okay. I'm going to ask that that be stricken. That's not responsive to the question. That's overruled. It was the response he gave. The state asked you if there were any videos uh, of of on Lori Val's uh, Lori for style and uh, and Lolly time at iCloud.com. Is that correct? Yes. And you indicated that there were hundreds of videos. Yes. The only videos that were played today were two, was, was one short video, correct? Two short videos. Two short videos. One of JJ and one of Tylee? Correct. All right. There were lots of videos of Lori singing with her children, correct? Yes. Lots of videos of her playing on the beach with her children, correct? Yes. Lots of videos of her interacting in total, totally normal ways with her children, right? Yes. Okay. None of those were shown today? Correct. Okay. On page two of the 92-page summary that you did, 
uh, line 2585 says, from Lori Bell to Audrey Baratario. Do you recall that conversation? Yes. Okay. Hi, Audrey. This is Lori. I would love to talk to you sometime. Text me or call me. I'm excited to be able to talk to you about what we both know. You recall that? I do. All right. So what was the relationship between Audrey and Chad? Audrey met Chad in the fall of 2018, and she viewed Chad as a spiritual advisor, someone that she looked up to for spiritual guidance. The leader? Yes. Okay. Chad had a number of women that he talked to over text or over the phone. Is that correct? Um, a small number, yes. Small number, okay. Uh, Melanie Gibb, she was one of those? Yes. Okay. Um, Melanie Boudreau, she was one of those? Correct. Okay. Anybody else? There was a reference to Julie Rowe, but I don't recall that I saw specific messages between Chad and Julie Rowe. What about Zulema Pastinez? Yes. She was also in the group? Correct. Okay. In fact, there were a number of women that were in the group with Chad, right? He was kind of the leader of this group. Along with Lori, yes. Okay. You went over a number of texts uh, in here, and I'm not going to go through them because... Well, we don't, we don't have the time. Um, not every text was about about the affair that Lori was having with Chad, right? Correct. There were a lot of normal texts, right? Between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow? Well, on Lori for Style or the, or the Lolly Time uh, at iCloud. I mean, there, there were just a lot of normal texts on there, right? C could you clarify between which parties? Sure. There were texts about Lori... Uh, doing normal mom stuff, right, to various people? Yes. Okay. There were texts about uh, Lori talking to her friends just about her day, right? Yes. Okay. There were, there were texts about uh, Lori taking her kids to school? Yes. Texts about Lori taking JJ or Tyree to doctor's appointments? Yes. Texts about Lori... Uh, giving them fast food or going out to restaurants? Yes. There were texts about the nuances or the, or the ins and outs of life, like paying bills, those kinds of things? Correct. Okay. And based on your review of the text as a whole, as the state has indicated, uh, you, you reviewed all these texts or very, a large number of these texts, um, isn't it true that Lori was, for all intents and purposes, a, a pretty good mother? With the exception of what happened to her children, yes. All right. And based on your review of the text as a whole, uh, Lori seemed to have led a pretty normal life until she met Chad David. Is that correct? Yes, I would say so. Okay. In your view of the totality of these uh, records that you reviewed, um, did it ever come up uh, what Lori's prior uh, Wi-Fi passwords have been over the last 13 years? Pri prior to the prior to 2019, the 13 years prior? I have a vague recollection of some exchanges between Lori Vallow and Charles Vallow as they moved residences along that line, but I, I could not tell you what those passwords were. Would it, would it surprise you if I told you that Lori's go-to password <clears throat> was the number five kids and the number four ever? Objection, your assumes facts, not in evidence. Overruled. That could certainly be the case. Okay. You, you don't recall seeing that ever come up in any text or anything? 
off the top of my head, I'm sorry, I can't remember. I may have seen that in my review of the iCloud. I, I don't recall specifically if I have or not. Okay. On the particular day that, that uh, you indicate um, where Alex sent Lori a text about setting up her, uh, her new password, um, is it possible that Lori was busy doing other things and that Alex was there to set up the password and he couldn't remember the five kids forever password and he told the guy who's the, the guy who set it up that it was just too many kids. Objection. Is that possible? Objection calls for speculation. That's sustained. Did you in your review find anything uh, to support your theory that too many kids meant that Lori had too many children, as in Tylee and JJ were too many. Just, no, the password stands alone. Okay. Do you know who Nathan Pacheco is? I do not. Okay. On page 49 of your text, So you didn't do any research as to who Nathan Pacheco is? I didn't. You didn't Google him? No. Would it surprise you to know that he's a, a fairly famous religious singer? I wouldn't doubt that. Okay. Um, and would it surprise you to know that he, um, that Lori, Lori had a crush on him? Judge, I'm going to object to this. It calls for speculation, relevance. Well, it's contained within texts that were read into the record, so the relevance objection is overruled, and uh, I'll allow some latitude there as it needs to be relevant. Sure. I have no knowledge of that. Okay. So it's possible that Lori and Chad's exchange about, because this was a, an abnormal exchange, right, where Chad uh, acquiesces to Lori's um, to, to Lori's uh, death percentage or whatever, what have you, right? That's correct. Okay. So this is an aberration of what normally happens. Yes. Chad normally says, this person is light, this person is dark, this is the number, and everybody just kind of goes along with it. That's right. All right. So if Lori had a crush on this guy and was joking with Chad about, hey, I think he's light, and Chad's joking with her about, I think he's dark, that would make more sense. That would put it into context, right? Objection. It calls for speculation. Defense counsel is attempting to testify. I'll sustain that. Okay. But in your, in your review of these 100,000 or so records, I don't know how many you said that you've reviewed, um, there was not another time where... Uh, Chad would give something, some type of a death percentage, and then Lori would override him that you can remember. That's correct. Okay. Did you ever hear any references to anybody named, named Ira and Ralph? Yes. Okay. And did you... Research who Ira and Ralph might be? I believe that Ira was the name of another entity that supposedly was in Charles Vallow's body. Ralph, um, again, I believe is a name of another entity, and I'm sorry I can't recall who Ralph was attached to. Okay. You ever watch Romancing the Stone? You ever seen that movie? With Kirk Douglas? Yeah. Or Michael Douglas? Yeah. Yeah. Would it surprise you to know that, that that is just a reference to the Romancing the Stone people? Judge, I'm going to object. There's facts, not assumes facts and not evidence, relevance. If I may respond, Judge. Go ahead. He's testified that he's reviewed all these records. He's seen Ira and Ralph come up a number of times. And I'm just asking if he knew the reference, if you actually did any research on it. I'll allow that for that purpose. Thank you. Did you do any research on it? Well, that's a 
a difficult proposition because these are names that Chad Daybell is assigning to these individuals. I don't know how I would do research on the name Ira or Ralph okay. outside of the context of the case. So no. Is that correct? That's correct. Very good. So uh, on page 51 of your summary, you indicate that J.J. was talking crazy and that he was saying crazy stuff. You recall that? Yes. He was at a zero. Um, and so my question is, what happens when a person reaches a zero percentage? According to the case, that means that they're ready for death. They're ready for death or they're dead or they're what? Well, clearly at that particular point in time, J.J. wasn't dead, but within six weeks he was. So basically, you also testified that depending on your scale or depending on how you want to look at it, they could be either 100 or 0, and those percentages would be towards death, right? Judge, I'm going to object as, as vague. It's not his scale. He testified. I apologize. Sorry, and uh, it's a compound question in states facts, not in evidence, and it's confusing. I don't believe it states facts, not in evidence. That did come out, uh, but it is a compound question. And Mr. Thomas, if you'd specify what the scale is you're talking about again. Very good. <clears throat> in other words, clarify it's not the witness's scale. Right. Page 20, line 2660. Turn to it. And I apologize, Council. Which email address? Twenty six sixty. Molly. It's on slide number twenty. It's line number twenty six sixty. So I'll just read it to you. Text from Chad Tabell to Lori Vallow. Quote, she is at point one three. I turned up the pain to 10 and placed a spiritual virus in her. He is at 99.99. Raphael visited him and told him to follow Amy into the light. I also assured him that James would love and take care of his mommy, which he will, which he will with all of his heart and soul. Do you recall that? I do. You wrote that in, in, or you copied that from a text? I cut and pasted it from the iCloud, yes. All right, and you testified today that either being a low percentage or a high percentage could mean death. Is that correct? That's my understanding. All right. So basically, isn't it your understanding that you really don't have an understanding about what's going on here as far as these percentages go? I disagree. I think that Chad Daybell's writings were inconsistent, but it's clear that he designated uh, J.J. and Ty Lee and Tammy Daybell as, as he had them in his death percentages, and all three of those individuals ended up dead. Okay. It's not possible that this was all about fantasy, that it's more of a Dungeons and Dragons, pull out your 64-sided dice type of thing. Is that is that possible? Absent the three people being killed, perhaps. Okay. All right. So on page 24, uh, I'm sorry, page 23. Page 23, there's some talk about uh, using swords of light to cut through uh, someone's aura. That's, that's not real, right? I don't think it's real. It's fantasy. Yes. All right. On 
On page 17, line 2706, it reads, from Lori Val to Chad Daybell, I just got the letter from the insurance company saying that I'm not the beneficiary. It's a spear through my heart. Who did you think he changed it to, Brandon or probably Kay? He left nothing for JJ, right? You remember that? Yes. And this is from Lori to Chad. Her main concern was that he, that Charles had left nothing for JJ, her son, correct? That's what she states. All right. Page 22, line 2603, this is from Chad to Lori. Quote, this trip to Utah had a lot of finality to it. I was told extreme changes are coming from me and to Utah. I welcome them both. This was on July the 18th, 2019. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. What types of uh, changes were coming to the state of Utah? I have no idea. You didn't look into that? That's a statement from Chad Daybell, in my opinion, as his position as a revelator. So I don't, I'm not privy to, he predicted earthquakes in Utah and other things. And did they happen? Did Chad Daybell's revelations come to pass? Right. Not in my opinion. Okay. So it was all fantasy. Correct. Not everything was fantasy. Okay. <clears throat> On page thirty four. This is from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Quote, from Mel B, semicolon, or I'm sorry, colon, from Father, my sweet daughter, you have done well. I am very pleased. You have been prepared for every moment and surrounded by those who love you. And then it goes on. And you indicate that Father, in that particular context, you thought was Chad Daybell. Is that right? Yes. It's not possible that Melanie Boudreau got her own revelation from God or Heavenly Father? I think in the line that follows, um, Lori makes a reference to Chad that that was a sweet message. Can you, read the, can you tell me the next line? That's a very nice message Mel B. received from Lori to Chad. Right. So you think that the message was from from Chad to Melanie Boudreau? Yes. Okay. And do you have any evidence of that? Only that Melanie Boudreau fre frequently referred to Chad Daybell as dad or her father. Okay. Okay. On page 41 of your summary, you make reference to a chart. Uh, I'll just read it to you. Line 1774. This is on July the 30th, 2019. Text from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallo. Yes, we might need to release a little steam when we talk. Anyway, this is the chart that checks what percentage mortals are still in their body. It worked for my friend's wife who died, my neighbor, George Bush, Stan Lee, etc. So did you recover the chart? 
I did not. I looked for it extensively and could not find it. Okay. Did you ask any other agents to look for the chart? Yes. And nobody could find the chart? Nobody could find the chart. So it was probably just something that he made up, some fantasy. I don't know if it's that or if it just didn't attach to the message. On page 47 and 48, you indicated in your testimony that Chad Daybell used religious concepts to manipulate others. Is that correct? Yes. What did you mean by that? Chad Daybell uh, purported himself to be a visionary man who could discern light and dark spirits. He claimed to receive revelations and he would use those things to his own selfish purposes. To manipulate a lot of people? Yes. Including Lori Dado? At times. Thank you. No further questions. Redirect. Yes, Judge, briefly. Uh, defense counsel asked you about Chad Daybell manipulating people. The last few questions, do you recall those? Yes. Okay. Um, was there evidence that Lori Vallow manipulated Chad Daybell? Yes. Was there evidence that Lori Vallow manipulated Alex Cox? Yes. And defense counsel asked you about fantasy versus fiction or fantasy versus reality. Do you remember those questions? Yes. For Alex Cox, in your review of all of the evidence, including the iCloud, did Alex Cox believe the religious information given him by Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell? Yes. Did Alex Cox act on the religious information provided to him by Lori Vallow? How do you mean? Did he move up to Rexburg? Yes. Did he move near his sister? Yes. Did Alex Cox believe the information given to him by Chad and Lori that he was Lori's protector? Yes. Okay. Now, defense counsel asked you about a, a bunch of women, some of whom we've heard from, some of whom we haven't. Did you remember those lines of question? Yes. How many of those women had their children dead and buried in Chad Daybell's backyard? None. Nothing further. All right, that'll conclude the testimony of this witness then. Counsel, given the uh, time, I'll suggest we go ahead and break for the day. Is the state going to be prepared to call another witness in the morning? Yes, Judge. Um, may this witness be excused? Uh, any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Agent, for testifying. You can be excused from any subpoena. The bailiff will assist you out of the program. Thank you, sir. Okay, at this time we'll go ahead and take our afternoon recess till tomorrow. Given that we're concluding for the day, again, I'll admonish the jurors. As you've done every day, thank you for your uh, service and continue to not investigate the case. Don't look up the case anywhere. If you see the case being reported in the media, please don't follow that. Turn your attention away from it. Don't discuss the case with each other or anyone else. Um, we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 8.30 for additional testimony and we'll adjourn for the day. All right, please.
Your Honor, yes. there's a couple of minor housekeeping issues. If we could just talk to counsel in the court, it doesn't have to be on the record. We just want to double check some things. All right, counsel, I'll just uh, be in chambers. Let me know when you're ready to discuss that. I think we're ready. So. Okay. If you don't want to put it on the record, let's just go talk about it in chambers and we'll get things straight. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Feel free to go. Please check uh, for all your property. Make sure nothing's wrong. Okay. 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 Ok